let's do this, or this is how they do it in Africa. And I thought that for a bunch of Lutherans, we did really quite good. But I wanted to show you, when you go to church in Burkina Faso, like we did, it's a three and a half hour service, you're in a concrete building with no air conditioning, and it gets really hot and it's really crowded. And smack in the middle of the service, this is what you're going to see. And ladies, look at those outfits. That's where you work. 
Uh, you'd be living in courtyards with your entire extended family, love them or not. Women spend the day to go out, family and the children, and their first their like Ruth and her mother-in-law, gleaning the grains of wheat. Then they go, you go home and you'd be pounding it in big wooden containers with your big wooden stick till it drinks powder and it's milk is what they eat. And then you cook it up for dinner. And meanwhile, somewhere in there, you walk however many miles or steps you have to to get to the nearest well and draw your water and bring that back. Everywhere you go, you see donkeys, goats, wandering the streets, there's stables everywhere you look. And you see little four-year-old shepherds taking the, uh, taking the animals out. Everybody's got a few animals, and they got chickens and roosters and all that. Babies are carried on the back all day while mom works, and if mom's too busy, then uh, the older children. Sometimes even five and six-year-olds are walking around carrying little babies on their back. It's a subsistence economy in most of the country, so they work to eat. That's it. Their homes are passed down from generation to generation, so there's no such thing as, for most people as rent or mortgages. They just stay in the family. And then what you spend all day doing is trying to generate enough work to be able to have something to eat that day. Family and community are really important in a place like this. So, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters, you did for me. This is the motto over there. The people who are being helped by the organization Sheltering Wings could certainly be the poster children for the least of these. So there's three schoolers like Gilly, who you'll see at the end doing his own special dance. <coughs> he was born HIV. Both of his parents, after he was born, died of AIDS. So his, his family group allowed him to continue to live within their compound, but because of the fear of AIDS and the stigma of AIDS, because you can't tell anyone you have AIDS. That's why people don't get treated. And they won't take the medicine that the white people bring because we're really just trying to kill off black people. So this is some of the information and myths that circulate and superstitions that circulate. So little Billy, who was absolutely adorable, was next was allowed to live in the compound, but he wasn't cared for. They, uh, they wouldn't even, they, they wouldn't handle him, they wouldn't comfort him, they wouldn't talk to him, they wouldn't even wash his clothes. So he came to the attention of uh, the social action committee, which is how most of these people come to the attention of this organization. But they wouldn't interact with him due to their own fears. There was a shield. Is he in there? Oh. It's really hard for you to see our pictures, I'm sorry. A shield uh, was born a dwarf. And again, he was allowed to stay within the compound, but he had to live in a grain silo because nobody, because he was a dwarf, there must be something wrong with him. The, the, the witch doctors of the community would have said that he was evil and could bring harm, so he needed to be shunned. And so their grain silos are actually don't look a whole lot different than their homes, because their homes are made out of, they take mud and straw and they form it into bricks, and then they build, and you'll see the same shape in all the pictures of what their homes look like. And they're complete. There's nothing inside them, and the floor is exactly the same as the outside. But the women live in some, and the men live, the women and children live in some, and then the men live in some of the others, and then they have grain silos where they store that, and of course in the bottom there might be snakes and vermin and all of that. And that's where a shield has to live. And then there's people like Martine, who we'll show you a picture of later, who, she was married, she was abandoned by her husband, he went to, this is a common thing that said, I'm going to the Ivory Coast to see if I can earn money. So they go to the Ivory Coast, and many of them don't come back, and many of them don't send money. So she was living in his village, they had three children, an older child, and twins. Now twins again, that's kind of iffy. So when somebody in the village died unexpectedly, the witch doctor, or somebody in authority, said that she was a witch and it was her fault, so they banished her from the village. So she had to leave this village walking with her three kids, and she couldn't go home to her own village 
even though an uncle was offering to take her in, but this uncle systematically abused her. She was as a children, I would say, what? Use your imagination. So she came to the attention of social action, and even though at that point, Sheltering Wing was an orphanage, or still is, uh, at times, in, in, they'd be asked to take people in, can you just house them for a little while somewhere in a room so we can find a place for them? And ultimately, Martine did get settled. Uh, they found someone to temporarily take care of the twins. She kept the oldest child. And they were eventually able to set her up with work and a trade so that she could learn to become self-supporting. And she, on her own, without ever being pressured to, decided to join the uh, Christian church. And we actually met her. We didn't meet her since, but we saw her as her oldest child. So why are so many orphans and women at risk? It's poverty, more than anything, and fear. Fear of, as the story you heard, fear of, I'm going to get sick if I don't listen to what the village people say. Fear of being abandoned. If, if you have nothing and, and your community uh, abandons you, you're lost. You might, in their minds, you might as well die. Children are thrown away in roadside. Babies. Older kids, too. <laughs> in latrines, they've been found. They've been found in wells because the, the parents can't feed them or the extended family can't take them in. Because for, for all the bad stories, and we have plenty of bad stories in our own society, there's lots of really good people. So you'll have one man and suddenly, okay, his brother left the wife. Okay, now I've got to take care of my brother's wife and her children. And then I've got my aging mother. And then I've got my other, my sister who was abandoned by her husband. And I've got to take her in. So sometimes the, the responsibility on the man who decides to be present and accountable is huge. And they simply can't afford to feed every mouth that's there. So when, when more children come into the picture, they're often abandoned. So sheltering wing doesn't just come in the great white hope and we're going to fix you. They work with local pastors and local social agencies. They offer hope and future to those who wouldn't have one otherwise. So did they help that single, that man who takes in his sisters and all her family too? Like, do they help in that sense? Well, actually they do because uh, uh, the person I sponsor, or lesson I sponsor, she's a widow, and we sponsor her because she does live in her son's compound. And that the story I just told you about, I had to take my sister in because her husband abandoned her, and, and my brother abandoned his wife, so now I've taken them in. So we, we are sponsoring the widow, the mom, in that home. Uh, in that compound, and the, the, the money that we send feeds her, gives her a fair bit of grain and several other necessities of life, and then she shares them with her family. And then one of their kids, um, her grandson, one of them actually lives in the orphanage because they couldn't afford to feed him, and they certainly couldn't afford to send him to school. His name was Eric C. He was a really nice young guy. And they brought him over to the orphanage so that he could go to school and hopefully come back and move back home and be able to contribute in some way. So that's how they help those families. So the experience that um, when you volunteer at Sheltering Wing, it's exactly what you decide to make of it. Mike said that many come simply to learn about their mission. They sit back and they just want to be shown everything. And he said, some of us come to minister. And he, that's what he said about Faith and I. We were involved, we worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week when we were there. We were involved in everything from playing the, the, the preschoolers and babies, organizing activities and games with the older kids. I think I told you once before that we did a, we spent one day doing an Olympics. We never laughed so hard in our whole life. At the end of the day, Mike said, thank you, because these kids don't have family afternoon. When they're when the old when the school age children are not in school, they're on their own in this compound. There's people hanging around, but they take care of themselves and each other. Uh, there's there's uh, tantras they call them who take care of the, the toddlers. 
and the baby. And the older kids help with the younger kids. We were also involved with uh, going to medical clinics. We set up medical clinics out in remote villages and saw hundreds and hundreds of people. We went to malnutrition clinics, so they go out and they go into villages and, and people bring their babies and we measure their arms and if they fall under a certain size, that's a sign of malnourishment. You see their bellies that are bloated because of the lack of protein and they're, they're malnourished. So what, what they do is they give them milk, a special milk supplement to give to the babies to qualify uh, being malnourished. And they're malnourished because their mothers are malnourished. Their mothers are trying to breastfeed them, but their mothers aren't getting any food. Uh, we also help teach Sunday school, impromptu Sunday schools. Some were planned, some were impromptu. We participated in the church services. They had us get up and talk, <laughs> which that was kind of intimidating. <laughs> you guys were tough, but they were tough. Uh, we did lots of cooking. We visited widows. We brought things to the widows, as you know from last week. We'll show you what we brought. And we participated, if you look up Tom's shoes, they, uh, for every pair of Tom's shoes you buy, they will give one to a poor person. And there are people who criticize that, actually. They say, why doesn't Tom sleep well? But we saw a child at the medical clinic. He was coming in three days a week, and he was getting a dressing done on the bottom of his foot. So something had happened that he, he cut his foot. And it didn't heal properly, it got infected. So eventually, it ate out like fifth, his fifth side from the bottom of his foot. And it was, it was never going to heal. And so all they were trying to do was keep it clean. And so you come in, they put a clean dressing on it, and clean bandages, and then they send him on his way, walking in the dirt, no shoes. So how long do you think that stays clean? So what, what's the plan here? And they said, we're waiting till he's old enough so we can amputate his leg. No particular reason for waiting, because I asked an American doctor, our Air Force doctor that we hooked up with one day at a Tom distribution and he I said, why would they wait? And he said, because they have a belief that you shouldn't do this when they're little, you should do this when they're 10. So this little kid was going to be allowed to have this leg when he was 10, then they're going to cut it off. In the meantime, he was at risk every single day for infection, again. And if it got into his bloodstream, he would have died, because there's no IV antibiotic that we would get. So Faith actually tried to give him a pair of slip-on <coughs> shoes to wear. So that's why... Maybe shoes isn't the most important thing, but we all do what we can do in Tom's need of shoes. And when you go on these distributions and help, we were fitting, one day we fit over a thousand children. It was quite the experience. Thanks to the support we got from everybody before we went. Oh, um, yes. We should sit, well, we'll say at this point too, it's not just Tom that gives jobs. So this is Yvonne. He grew up in the orphanage himself, and then he went to school and he wanted to do a business degree. Now you have to remember a lot of these kids don't start school. Some of them are starting school when they're 12 years old. So you can see that by the time they're 22, <coughs> they are never going to qualify for university. They just started too late. So Yvonne's this really bright, wonderful man. We got to know him quite well, and he, he tried really hard and couldn't pass the exam. So Sheltering Wings, actually, Mike and Amy, who are the directors then, they, they hired him to do the Tom's distribution. This is something you have to apply to the Tom's company. It takes about a year to get the rights, and Tom's actually paid the bond. They, they sort of had him helping at first, and then they gradually groomed him. So he takes over, and he runs the whole thing, and they, they hire local kids when it's time to go to do the distribution, if they have volunteers, we all go. But we, you need to fit a thousand kids, you need a lot of help. So they hire local kids, and there's, there's a picture of one child in there, he has Down syndrome, and you can imagine how poorly he's been treated with Down syndrome living there. They provide all kinds of other jobs. There's a guy named Bernat, who is the manager of the orphanage, day-to-day -day operations. They have other people who are groundskeepers, they have other people who are the maintenance people, they have, uh, you have to have guards on the gate uh, day, by, day and night just to make sure that, because what you get is people creeping in, well, if you're helping them, will you help me? Or they might want to come in and take something because 
there's blankets, there's medicine, there's things. I mean, people are desperate. They'll come in and take it. So you need guards, so they pay them. So they, they don't just give, they provide uh, jobs. The idea that the, that, that the orphanage will be self-sustaining by local people. Anyway, so thanks to the support of everybody, lots of people, we were able to do a number of things. We got uh, blankets and pillows and uh, mattresses to the widows who were living on these concrete floors and had never slept on anything soft in their life. And the first person we brought it to, she just went, I never thought I'd live long enough to see this day. And this other one, she was putting her arms up in the air and she was yelling, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Where they do dances for us and they were so excited. So we did that. We brought uh, many things for the children. Faith, you must tell me. <laughs> oh, we did the diaper campaign. I remember all of us who sold hundreds of diapers. We had, yes. Yeah. Anyway. I'll just tell you, the big, our, big, our big focus has been the widows. Friends of mine, Mark and Brenda Jennings, they're motorcycle lovers just like we are, and when they heard that Ernest needed a motorcycle, and Ernest is the manager of the orphanage, the local manager, and he, he had polio as a child, so he walked his feet or stuff out like this, and his feet were flat as he walked. And he, he's capable of walking, but not very far a distance. At that point, he was living across the street from the orphanage, so it wasn't as big a hardship. But he also had to go out into the community and do business for the needs of running the orphanage. And he always had to rely on people to go do it for him. He couldn't, he couldn't ride a bicycle, and he, he certainly couldn't ride a motorcycle, or a moto, as they call it. So our friend paid to purchase a motorcycle over there and have it modified so it's all hand controlled. And you've never seen such joy in your life as the day it got delivered. So you can see, I'm assuming that's Ernest? Yeah. And his wife. And they were just tickled. They, they made up a song that night. They stayed awake all night. They couldn't sleep. He was so excited. And they came over and they sang the song for us the next day, which we were able to record and show our friends. Uh, and then Martine. So this is Martine. That's the lady I told you about with the twins. When we were there, we had al we'd also been given a substantial gift, financial gift, and asked to, we, we didn't quite know what to do with it. And so the, the advice, what we were given by the donors is the inheritance to go over there, see what was needed, and use the money in the best possible way. So we, we heard Martine's story and we met her. We heard stories of 13-year-olds who were who were, uh, had been betrothed by their fathers to be the fifth wife of a 65-year-old somebody who ran away and then was caught and then was beaten and then ran away again because she was given refuge. Um, oh, so many stories of... Oh! One lady, she, her husband wanted their son to be offered up for a, um, a ceremonial thing by the local witch doctor to something that was supposed to bring good luck to the village. But what the mother had noticed was that any child who had been brought to this ceremony ended up dead or brain damaged. And so she said, no, you're not taking my son. So he would have been, you know, eight years old, about, I think. And so, of course, she got beaten and abused and so on, <coughs> ran away. Her own family wouldn't take her back in because she dishonored them by not, by not obeying her husband. So we started hearing all of these stories, and they said, and social action would bring these people to sheltering wings and say, can you harbor them temporarily? They said, you know what, we really need a, a, uh, a women's shelter. And they were moving, they had two schools, they have two schools, 
And they just kept the younger kids on the compound in the school, and they were moving the younger kids to be with the older kids about four miles away. And they were going to go to school there. And so then they, so they had space, and they wanted to renovate that space. Well, it's the typical story that you hear. Somebody asks for something, and how much do you need? And wasn't that the exact money that had been donated to us by the staff of uh, Rocky Cross Construction and by the book So, they built the Village of Hope. It's been, uh, it took quite a while to get it going. So they, so they got it built. They had, they had their first graduating class group a few months ago. They must be on their second group now. The women stayed for about six months. They, uh, and their children, and they live in safety. Some of the kids, some of the women who were brought, I mentioned the Ivory Coast. There are young women taken, young girls, taken to brothels on the border between Burkina and the Ivory Coast and introduced to prostitution, drugs, and they have no, no hope, no way to get out. So, but there are groups that go in and rescue these girls. The problem is if you don't take them away far enough, the people who took them there in the first place will come and find them. So Yako, where we were, happens to be far enough away from the coast, from the border, the Ivory Coast, that it's too much trouble to come and get them. So they have, they have those girls there as well, and their children. So they're, uh, first they're given safety, they're fed and they're clothed, they, they grow gardens right on the site, and then they're taught a trade, and the trades there for women are soap making, uh, seamstresses, or tailoring, and weaving. And so they're taught these trades, they're taught how to set up a business, they're learning how to speak French, which is the, they all have their language, which is more uh, but at one point it had been a French colony. So the official, one of the official, the official language is French. So when the kids go to school, they're all taught in French. So the, the, the women are being learned, or taught how to speak French as well. And a little bit of learning to, to be able to manage finances. And they were really excited because they had the first graduating class. So, why is this important? Well, how big is the school? How big is the school? Hundreds. Because oh. if they, if you build a school, the government will actually send in teachers. And so the government pays for the teachers. The same when they built the medical clinic, the government will send in nurses. So they don't have to pay for the nurses, they don't have to pay for the teachers. And then they make it big enough that um, uh, there's a lot of kids who are, who are sponsored to go there because it does cost money. There's no public education funding. Uh, and then other people. And even in those classrooms, there's four or five kids, tiny little kids, and they're all squished together like this, and they, they might, might be lucky if they have a chalkboard between two, and three, two or three of them. Sharing it. I think there were 60 kids in that class. More than that. There was a lot of kids. We couldn't even count them. There were so many kids. They were just sitting on top of each other. One teacher. What is the graduating class? What happens next? Oh, what happens next? Well, this is what you're going to find out. What we would like to help happen next. Uh, Kim's going to talk about that. But I wanted to. So we're going to talk about now about what, what we hope to do this time. And why is why is why do you think that this work is important? They don't go. They social action goes. So think about our social services. Our team was kicked 
out of her belly. She wasn't wanted. So the young girls, I don't know if it, I don't know how it all initiates. I don't know if it's a family member that says they stole my daughter, she's there. Somehow it comes to the attention of a group called Social Action. Social Action then mobilizes a number of agencies and a number of resources, and Sheltering Wings just happens to be one of them. And, and there was no, in that town of Yaffa where we were, and there's, all that's around Yaffa is a whole bunch of little villages. So think of Yaffa as Calgary, uh, in the Bay of Ruth, and then uh, all the little villages are like Airdrie and Okotoks, and it takes you forever to, to get to these if you're walking. You, by vehicle, it, it, some of them were pretty hefty, healthy drive on dirt and old riverbeds and no roads and so. So as we were preparing for this, we thought it's important to tell you why we think this is important work. Because there is tons we can do here, right? We've got the refugees here that we can be working with. We've got all of our own poor people. So I was going back through all the color pictures and anything we'd written from last time, and I found in my journal, I'd written a note one day, we'd been there approximately a week. And uh, we, that was the day we did a Tom's distribution of a thousand kids. And that, that night I wrote, so much of what we did on this day is not possible for the average Burkina Bay. That's what they call themselves, we're Canadians, they're Bur Burkina Bay. I woke up in a bed that had blankets after having slept under an electric fan. I was able to use an indoor toilet. I had toilet paper. I had tap water. There was even warm water the night before I had taken a shower, actually, and had shampoo to use. I was able to brush my teeth. I had toothpaste and a toothbrush. And I had soap and I had lotion. I was able to put on clean clothes. I had a choice of what clothes to put on. And my clothes were clean because somebody had been hired to wash my clothes with scrub board. I was able to cook a breakfast on a stove inside the house of coffee, eggs, and I was able to get yogurt out of the refrigerator. I also got my ice water for the day, which freeze big bottles, water bottles, overnight, so it stayed with ice all day, because we're in 35 degree temperatures all day, it was really hard to cool off, and we carried those around all day. I went out to work, which that day was a Tom's distribution, and I rode in a truck. Unlike the thousand children who came to get their shoes, who all walked to get there. Afterwards, we were able to go, oh, while I was there, I met this Air Force doctor, and I said, I've got a couple kids at the orphanage I'd really like to, to have you look at. Um, and he wasn't really supposed to. He was there for the Air Force, and why they were there, I don't know. I asked him, he said, if I told you, I'd have to tell you. <laughs> But he did. We, we sat, I said, well, come and have tea with us or something cool, and I'm just going to walk these children by you, and you can scan them, and you can tell me what to do. And he did. So I was able to get a doctor to examine two sick kids. I had ordered a dress from the local seamstress who worked in the orphanage, and I, I had money to pay her. And then the home that we were staying in, we actually stayed with Mike and Amy, who were the directors, and they lived about two blocks from the orphanage. Not, not in a different kind of home that I would have stayed if, had I stayed in the orphanage, but different than all of our neighbors. Because we, we were able to invite all the school girl kids, school girl age kids from the orphanage to a girls' party that night, and we had we watched a DVD, we baked, we taught them how to bake, they taught us how they baked. <laughs> we ate treats, we did pedicures and manicures for the girls, and in that day, I was able to read a book. I was able to study my Bible. And I was able to write in a journal. So what did I have that they didn't have? I had choice. I had the benefit of progress, science, education that has led to a better quality of life that many of these people don't have. And so therefore, they stay in that terrible situation for generations. I practiced this so I wouldn't do this. Okay, the, the need is actually so overwhelming that it's easy to give up and to actually not even try. And you think to yourself, even while you're sitting, why are we doing this? this? We took all the school-age kids in groups, boys and the different groups, out for lunch for a treat at 
the vulture and hay rack stuff. And while we were there, we had them tell us what they wanted to do when they grew up. None of them wanted to get married until they were 28 because they needed to be established in an education and in a, in a profession so they could pay to raise, so they could afford a wife and children and support them so they didn't end up back in the village, just the subsistence existence. So what do you want to be? We want to be teachers, doctors, nurses, just like our kids want to be. And the one, I was telling my <coughs> director this, oh, this is so cool, we just learned that he wants to be a doctor and she wants to be a teacher and he wants to be in the army because they're well paid. Um, and he said, most of them won't. They'll go back to their village. And I just went, are you kidding me? What are we doing here? Why are we doing, why would you educate somebody and then send them back to that? And he said, so each one of them has an opportunity to see that life can be different. They can learn, they can bring that knowledge back to their own community, they can change how crops are grown, they can find sustainable ways to get crops going in a semi-desert in the periods of drought. They can learn how superstitions that generate fear and abuse can be eradicated. So they can change their work bit by bit. So they can hope, hope for a better life by investing in the least of these. As I went through my journal, I also saw that I must have been reading a book by one of my favorite Christian writers. She's a bit unorthodox, her name is Anne Lamott. Anyway, she said, God doesn't need us to bring hope, life back into lives, but keeps letting us help to keep each other from falling or to help each other back up. And sometimes love doesn't look like what you have in mind. She also wrote, there's hope in resurrection. First to heal, we have to stand in the middle of the horror, at the foot of the cross, and wait out another suffering for that person to see it. Or maybe it's our own suffering where we ourselves wait to put the cross, grieving an unsurvivable loss. Christ crucified is that child thrown out with the garden, left to die, and resurrection is the food and the milk in the orphan's bowl. But the good news is that then there is often new life, and we do all come out of change. So maybe each person, and each child, and each widow, and each young woman, that's reached by this ministry understands that there are better ways, and maybe each one of them will change the world in one small way, so it's changed bit by bit. Famous Mother Teresa line said, none of us can do great things, but we can all do small things with great love. And so now, Faith is going to talk to you about what are some of those small things we hope to do, and not so small things that we hope to do when we go over How you um, that I want to add something. Um, you have to know that last time when I came and spoke here, Sonia had asked me to come and speak, and um, I was way out of the comfort zone. <laughs> and I remember getting up and having some really not so great thoughts about coming. I'm like, really? You want me to go? Oh, like, really? What, what's going to happen out of this anyway? Like, why am I bothering? And I just want you to know that attitude was wrong, but it changed not only my life, but it changed their lives. Because I'm wrong in faith. These women have so much hope. And if I hadn't been willing to come, and as the author had a quote that said, if you want to walk on water, you have to step out of the boat. And so I believe I stepped out of the boat that day, and I'm thankful that I did. So. Ways. 
And so when I prayed about our return trip, and God did answer by bringing Sonia with me because I really wanted her to come again. I said, God, show me what it is that you would like us to bring or do this time because I didn't want, you know, I don't want to just go for no reason and I don't want to go just for me. I want to go and make, we want to go and make a difference. And lots of people will say to me, well, you know, I'm just bringing them stuff. How does that change things? Well, it's true. Sometimes just bringing stuff doesn't help. So we have some bigger plans in mind. God's asking us to step out of the boat again. We will bring the gifts of our time, your prayers and ours, and willing helping hands. And we'd also like to provide some practical and financial support. So, uh, One, one day out of the blue, uh, a new client of mine came in and she started talking to me about solar powered lights specifically made to for people living in these areas with little or no electricity. And having experienced how difficult it is to navigate and read when the sun goes down, I thought, this is perfect. So after a lot of internet Searching and emails, I found this type of solar powered light. Now, I sent one to Amy to make sure it would stand up in Africa so that I would know that we wouldn't be wasting our money on nothing. And so she says it is fantastic. Now, this tiny little light will, it's hard to see because it's so light in here, but this little light will light up a 10 foot square group. And so widows, orphans, families in the crisis center all will benefit from these. We even have an SOS. <laughs> also, uh, last time we brought some of these little sewing kits. Um, you know, people say, well, can't you buy the stuff there? Well, yeah, you know, we can buy things there. They're not that great. You can, you can. But these little tiny sewing kits are amazing, and it was, it was fantastic because we handed them out to some of the girls at the orphanage. And next thing you know, I saw them. They're fixing their clothes. They're sewing, and these are quite amazing little uh, sewing kits. So those are a couple of the things that, uh, tangible things that we want to bring. Um, but there's, there's more. And later I was reminded that um, when in our previous trip, when we were delivering the mattresses and the blankets and the pillows to the widows, often followed by prayer, and Amy would always say, what else can we do for you? And um, uh, some of the widows had heard about Bibles in their native language, and you know how difficult that would be to get a Bible in the language of Mori, but talk that with Mostly they're illiterate, they can't even read. So even if they did have a Bible in their language, they either can't see or they can't read. And so Amy had mentioned something about Mega Voice. So again, I started doing research and uh, I, it's a very long story, but I'm telling you, God had his hand in this. And um, I found a company in Canada originally uh, I had, could only find something for the states and that was going to cost duty and you know the problem with that. And so I found it in the states and they, they uh, have the New Testament and God's story in Canada, yes, on a solar powered MP3 um, in their language of Mori and they're only two and a half ounces. So. They're which? Two and a half ounces? Oh, Ten ounces for a little oh, oh. <coughs> Again, you can't see it here, but it's about this. They told me, I've, I've ordered some and they haven't um, come yet, but they said they're smaller than a cell phone with two and a half ounces. And they 
have God's story and the New Testament on them in their Moray language, so they will be able to listen to it. Um, and it's just, it seems improbable, you know, but God always has his hand in these things. Uh, and the main, the main uh, religion there was not to the The main, no, the main uh, religion is Muslim, I would say, would be predominant. Actually, it's, it's animus. Oh, yes, that's so right. How they describe it is 100% of the population is animus, so they believe in God in all living things. But that leads to a lot of superstition, and they have all these things that they wear to ward off evil spirits, and it doesn't, you know, offering sacrifices and all of those things. So everybody is animus. And from that, I now, the latest thing I read was that about 10% are Christian, mostly Catholic, and about 40, 45% are Muslim. But whether they are Muslim or Catholic, they're all animals. So for these widows, they're probably all animals. And they may have been exposed to some Muslim, and a little bit in that, at least through some of these organizations, they're being exposed to Christian pastors. And so when they're, when they're hearing prayers or they're hearing any word, they're from the Christian perspective. So for them to ask for these things, really something. <coughs> so another major project that we uh, oh yes okay that we want to do is help um, so through the women's center that was started, um, and, and Sonia spoke earlier about how they are going through the training, so we're, we're teaching them to, um, you know, weaving and sewing and soap making and French, and we're, so they've gone through the program, but they still don't own anything, so that's nice, now they have the skills, but they don't have anything to work with. And so for them to be self-sustainable, um, and they need to put up a business of sorts. Now, they need set up as small collectives or individual, um, but in any case, if they don't have a sewing machine or a weaving loom, they, can't, they still can't do anything. So our idea was that we would like to start um, little um, <coughs> funding for them so that they could each start have startup fees. So once they could loan the startup fees from us, they could work together and pay off that, and then they could in turn give it to the next person. Now this could take years for them to be able to pay this off, but it would make them feel as if it was their own. They would have worked for it, and then they could help and um, support their children. So um, just so you have an idea, um, helping to start up with weaving, $365. Helping to start up with sewing, $395. Help to start soap making, $120. Now, we're also wanting to, um, well, okay, so then it, 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 did, it dawned on me one day that there was a theme here, bringing the light of the world to Burkina with, with our little lights. So actual light by the lamps and light to their souls and spirits with the good news of Jesus by the MP3 players. And then as always in a country where people go to bed hungry every night, we would like to just include a little parcel of food for the widows. And last time, um, so I mean I did that just for our individual widows that we sponsor and I'm telling you, it was, it, it, it was something to behold. Um, we, we gave them a bag with um, coffee, tea, sugar, uh, maggi, which is like a bouillon cube, uh, tomato paste, and cookies. And I remember my widow, Christine, she said, I'm dining out tonight. That's how excited she was over what we consider everyday stuff in our house. 
So we wanted to add that to the package when we go to see the widows as well. So as you can see, we put together a little package there, uh, a solar Bible, some chickens, some treats, a silver lamp for a widow, it's approximately $60. That's two live chickens. Yes, two live chickens. It's true. And we have ways and means. We have to take them on the plane. No, 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 we get them over there, but we, we sit in the back of a truck with a whole bunch of chicken coops. So Sometimes it's we have to hold them. <laughs> And it's, and it's kind of cool because we're also then helping someone else because we are purchasing the chickens from someone. So there's so many ways where it's not just helping the one person, it, it, it's helping the whole economy in, in, uh, in this. So I want to really thank you again for letting us come. It means a lot to me. And now it's time now. Has a few more things. Just, just before you finish, yes. I can't see anything on that screen. That's okay. We have in the back, we have um, envelopes if you want to take a person and you got a question. And so, oh, oh. Is, is that what? So, is that a budget per per person that you want to sponsor? So there's so many persons yes, okay. that you want to sponsor, and so what would be the total okay. type of thing? So yes, the sponsorship, what we try to do, it's been a little bit difficult. The only way we can really communicate is over Facebook. I don't have Facebook, so Faith does it. Um, and we're trying to fire questions back and forth. And we're trying to, we haven't got the exact breakdown. We keep trying to get it. Because everything would be purchased over there. If, we, if, you, if you decided to sponsor, say, a seamstress. So the 300, we thought we were working on 250. Well, it turns out it's this much, or 220. It's this much US. So now we've converted the money and discovered 300 to buy a sewing machine over there and the materials necessary to set somebody up in a shop. What all this involves, we're not sure. If it means they're going to work out of their home or they're going to rent a little space, we met Taylor's who rented a little hole in the wall to work. But they're going to need threads, they're going to need materials and, and their sewing machine. What likely what they would do is that $300 for we would say that's from one person, but likely what they would do is put four or five women together. And knowing them, they'll probably sew seven days a week, 24 hours a day in shifts, trying to sew uh, to sell money, or to sell in order to feed their children because they can't, they don't have crops. They will, the women, they find isolated, in the town, you can, you can rent isolated um, huts. I don't know who owns them. It must be on somebody's land, or you can rent a hut in somebody's compound. So the women could, would then have to get enough money to pay somebody to live in these huts and, and to buy food for their children. So there's still not much different than, uh, the, uh, an economy where you live to simply to eat. But at least it gives them a means. If these women didn't have this, they actually wouldn't have anything. They'd have to be begging or prostitution. So. 300 from what we can figure out, that's US, or that's Canadian converted to US. So 300 Canadian, four sewers, 360 for the weavers. They need more equipment because they take the actual cotton themselves, they spin it by hand, they dye it, and then they turn it into cloth. So they need a bit, it's a bit more complex. And again, that's an operation that can include a number of women. And what we may find when we get there is these number of women, maybe they all live together. We're not entirely sure. And then the soap making was about a hundred. Yes. Where do they sell it? They sell it locally. Like yep. Yep. Well, uh, there's markets in Yapo, and we went to them. We bought fabric in Yapo. Every three days, there's a market that you can go there. You can buy everything from the best donuts you've ever had in your life to uh, dried fish, dried herbs. It's, it's, it's an experience of a lifetime going to this market. And they have stalls and stalls of material set up. So they have to be able to sell enough in a day to be able to feed themselves. Yes? But if everybody is poor in that place, how do they get the money to buy that stuff? Or is it tourism that comes through? In Yapo, it's not tourism. Part of what, what the orphanage depends on is, is do, 
Did you remember we came back last time and I badgered everybody into buying placemats? <laughs> that was their woven fabric. That's the one thing that they have yet to develop. Uh, we, we, we started a conversation with them about our, because I'm, I'm working with a local artisan here to try and come up with crafts that can be made uh, for sale over there using what they have. So I'm learning about making actual goods out of leftover material, scrap material. Um, making jewelry out of scrap material, making household things out of that. So I said, are we going for a tourist market or are we going for a local market? Because a tourist will buy a basket made out of black garbage bags and material, which I'm gonna learn how to do, scrap material and black garbage bags. But a local isn't gonna buy a basket. They're not gonna buy a poster. They're not gonna buy, a, you sit on the ground and eat with your fingers. You don't need a placemat. You don't need a napkin. You don't need a poster. So it's diff it, that is a huge challenge when we get there is to figure out how, uh, how, how they can earn their money. So they, whether they'll be starting to make contacts, this may be beyond the scope of their operation. You gotta remember they're a really small operation. And you gotta remember the number of people we're helping is a finite number of people. We're not flooding the market with hundreds of seamstresses by any stretch of the imagination. And some of them are from other centers, so they'll go back to where they came from in the first place and take their skills back there. Because everybody does wear clothes, everybody actually ultimately has to figure out a way to buy clothes. They're, they're not what you and I would, would consider clothes necessarily, but. So. And, so, and I think Ron was also asking how many women, and. So it sounds like about $500 on, on average is gonna handle the three different locations. You want, well, no, if you wanted to do the three, it would be three, six, sixty. No, I'm just saying on average. I'm just saying on average. A $500 bill will help likely on average take care of a person and give them a vocation. And so how many people are you trying to help uh, obtain a, a vocation or develop a vocation? Is there 50 people? Is there 20 people? Is there 100 people? Oh, uh, these are the questions we need, so thank you, Ron. We will yes. contact Amy. She's really good about responding to this right away. We we'll find out how many. Exactly, because even with their first graduating class, I, I, and, and I think it differs each time with who comes in with social action. So um, the way I see it is we, we don't have an exact number, but there's always more women coming and going. So it, it doesn't matter if we want to have money there available for 2,000 women, eventually, I'm, I'm making up a weird number, but they will eventually use it, but, <laughs> yeah. But, but we will find that out. So yes. let us just finish this really quickly, and then we'll take a whole bunch more questions, if you have, okay? Because we are embarking on something that talked a little bit more this time, trying to set these women up in business, uh, we ended up deciding to do a fundraiser, at, an official one night fundraiser, which we, neither one of us has done before, so we're stumbling our way through this one too. On May 28th, we are having a fundraiser downtown. It's at the Unicorn. And uh, there will be, uh, it's just being set up now, an ability to buy tickets online. And so for $20, and I guess there's a service charge, so it's about $21.40, if that's a ticket for one person, you get dinner. It's a taco bar. It will be open for a couple of hours. There'll be a chef standing there, eat everything all you want. And uh, we will be having a silent auction as well. And we will, if we get part of the proceeds of that $20, we'll go to the restaurant. And part of it, they're doing it at cost for us and uh, the rest will go into this project for the, for the women. We're doing a silent auction, so we have a number of things up for bid, and if you have anything you'd like to offer, so like WestJet tickets somewhere, uh, to be, or place to stay, or something small, we'd be happy to take anything to put in the auction. And we will be doing a trivia night, so a fun, a fun game. And for all guys, it's a sports bar, so there's going to be uh, sports things that you can do and sports things that you can watch. So it'll be fun, fun for everybody. 
Um, oh, the $20 includes dinner and a drink. So I will, as soon as I get the link, which I'm hoping to get on Monday, we're still work, just working through that, I will send it to Pastor. He can send it out to everyone. We, we're, just as we talk to people, they're getting really excited, so we kind of think we might sell out fairly quickly. We, we're, we, we said we would take two, about half the bar, but um, it sounds like, like they'll give us the whole top floor of the unicorn. It's new, by the way, unicorn. Anybody knows about the unicorn? Anyway. Uh, but we wanted to tell you one more thing. Oh, yes, this is our, it's unfortunate because you can't see. So the one little guy, his name is Gilly. We caught this purely by accident in the baby cage one day. It's called the baby cage. Here's the microphone. Put the microphone. Cafe 
and had coffee with him in that very cafe. And it's the one isolated incident of terrorism in this country, and Al-Qaeda came in with the intent. They targeted an upscale hotel, and then this cafe was across the street. And Mike was sitting there with Pastor Valentin, the local pastor who supports, who he works with. And there was a group of Canadians sitting there. They were with some other um, not-for-profit organization. And there was, I think, six of them. And four of them, they were all sitting there waiting for the plane. The plane comes in in the evening, lets off the new people, and then takes home the returning people. So the Canadians were returning, four of them were returning, and Mike and Pastor Valentin were waiting for, for actually quite a big group out of Florida to come. And the, these people knew that. And they came in and they deliberately target what it is. Uh, they knew there was diplomats there, Caucasians, people who came to help. And they don't want the people who live there to have hope. They don't want them to help, have help. They want them to be desperate. And so they opened fire and Mike was killed. So, an isolated incident in an otherwise peaceful country. After prayer and talking with her family and looking into her own heart and thinking about what Mike wanted, Amy has chosen to remain in Africa as the director of the orphanage and to continue this work. And so we, uh, we had to really give it some thought as well. And we wouldn't deliberately walk into a really unsafe situation. If it was volatile, we wouldn't go. If it becomes volatile, we won't go. But as long as it, this is an isolated incident, we will go in October, we're already booked to go. And so because she continues this work, we would very much like to support her to continue this work. So you can, you can support us by either prayer, encouragement, it all helps. There's a, there's a display set out there. If you want to grab an envelope and you look at it and say, if you feel moved to put some money in it, tell you on the front what it's for. Just put it in the offering plate. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, then Wolfgang will be able to give you a receipt through the church, tax deduction through the church, for that part. Or you can come say to our, uh, our uh, 